How are yous? If you're new to the channel and this is the first video you've watched, good on you for giving the channel a crack. If you're a return viewer, thank you very much. I really appreciate the support. The Primarchs are some of the most popular beings in a setting packed full of insane, tragic and savage characters. Whether through misinformation, misunderstanding or just plain bias, these 18 demigods have been judged unfairly and inadequately in the past. An injustice we plan on correcting right now. One month ago, we posted a YouTube community vote on the channel to see what content you wanted to see next. And the worst Primark ever to exist was the winner. So good job guys. This led us to create what has become a four part video series to examine and rate each of the 18 known Primarchs. I say four parts because the script has blown up into a 56 page essay. It's been a long and detailed road, but I feel as a fledgling creator, I have learnt a lot and I just hope people have found it worth their while and entertaining because at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. Now we've already completed three videos totaling 13 Primarchs, with this video diving into the last five. Of the 18 Primarchs we know to have existed, there are some which are obvious fan favourites, such as the Great Angel Sanguinius or his dark mirror, the Red Angel, Aengron, and others which have suffered from negative impressions by inconsistent writing or a lack of fleshing out within the lore, such as the laser catching, sand eating Ferris Manus. What we're seeking to achieve while delving into the lore of each one of these superhuman, aloof individuals is to form a considered opinion to end the debate on who in fact really is the worst Primark. Before we get into it, we're nearly at that almighty benchmark 1000 subs. Going by the YouTube analytics, over 97% of those watching content aren't subscribed. If you're one of those people and you do enjoy the content and you intend to keep watching the videos we release, please consider subscribing and even hitting the notification bell as it really helps the channel growth and it doesn't cost you anything. Okay, there are some truly magnificent Primarchs to consider and rate within part four. The three previous videos have been a bumpy ride and we have scores mid-maxing all the way through. We'll run through our process for rating now. However, I have placed chapters in the video so if you've heard this bit before, or you aren't interested in the parameters we're using to measure these siblings, feel free to jump ahead now to the Praetorian of Terror himself, Rogel Dawn. Our first criteria of measure is in regards to a Primarch's achievements. These could be relating to military operations where humanity's history was rewritten in the crucible of battle, or peaceful agendas in an age soaked in blood. Some Primarchs even plan beyond the military purpose of their legions, this application of their son's talents being put to work, assisting humanity and bettering themselves when not campaigning. I believe these are all important considerations when assessing the achievements of a Primarch. One major factor we must also bear in mind is that considering fully half the 18 Primarchs turn to chaos, measuring these individuals' success against purely imperial ideologies and achievements would automatically place them all on the lowest nine ranks. For this reason, we must keep an open mind and perhaps extend our criteria to more general characteristics and achievements, so as to keep the playing field level. For example, terrible achievements can still be great in their magnitude. Secondly, the negative events a Primarch brought about through brash mistakes, an imperfect temperament at odds with the perfection of their gene crafting. It is easy to judge these actions retrospectively. But we must keep in mind the Primarchs wielded great power and were not perfect. A misjudgment or miscalculation could have severe repercussions when commanding the military force of thousands of elite military personnel and voidcraft. As most 40k law addicts are aware though, there are quite the number of tragic and unfortunate events to choose from. As we noted earlier in the video, if we were to judge the traitor Primarchs on such a basis, they would all receive the lowest mark possible, as their dedicated actions would bring much suffering and death to the galaxy. In their case, we can assess the issues they caused whether purposefully or unwittingly during their time as loyalists, rather than once they threw their lot in with the Dark Pantheon. Lastly, we'll consider a Primarch's character and personality, and how at times these attributes affected those they were associated with, such as their brothers, legionary sons, or the Imperium in general. We can to a degree lean on the wisdom of our ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle. His teachings on what is a good person outline four main core traits. Aristotle states the four cardinal virtues to define a good person as such are wisdom, 
Temperance, I feel like half the list just failed. Justice, though not the Nostraman kind. And finally, Fortitude. Clearly, the 18 Primarchs are not mere mortals, and so their frame of mind and the general grand scale of their plans and foresight is not able to be understood easily, though we can do our best in trying. Rogel Dawn, the Praetorian of Terra, Shield of the Emperor, and the very first Lord Commander of the Imperium before it was cool. Rogel Dawn is Primarch of one of the most storied legions in existence his name synonymous with the greatest of his brothers and his gene line responsible for guarding Terra itself since before the heresy, through into the current setting. A quote from the novel Saturnine, Rogel Dawn to his assembled kill team captains prior to the defence of caverns underneath Saturnine Gate from the sons of Horus and Emperor's children. I have done my utmost to make this palace a true fortress. I've built it from the ground up diligently. Some say, obsessively, making sure that it is impenetrable and secure. But that is an impossible task. There will always be cracks, there will always be flaws. No fortress of mere stone and steel in our galaxy is truly impervious, so I must place myself directly before those cracks and block them with my own flesh and fury. I am the fortress now. Rogel Dawn was fiercely loyal to humanity's cause from the point of his discovery by the Emperor, never taking a backward step, and whose own morals would see him viewed as a good person if it weren't for all the genocide and extinction level eradication of species throughout the Milky Way galaxy, which tends to be glossed over by some of the fanbase. Even prior to the events of the Heresy, Rogel Dawn was famed for his stalwart and indeed stoic nature. These traits also prevalent within his legionaries as well as featuring heavily in their combat doctrine, as utterly implacable in defence as he is indomitable in the attack. Rogel Dawn could be one of the most talented all-rounder Primarchs of the 18 known brothers. Now, any list of Rogel's accomplishments would be remiss without mentioning his defence of the Imperial Palace and the Soul System in general from the predations of his traitorous brothers. The feat alone of adequately fortifying the Imperial Palace, a pre-existing structure which was in itself the size of some continents, let alone for the purpose of defending against the greatest combined military force in the galaxy, is truly a monumental feat, and one that would have weighed down and defeated any lesser man, or even Primarch. Throughout the Siege of Terra, we see Rogel become ever more introspective, it is clear the weight of such a constant and ultimately unwinnable war is taking its toll on him. However, he never capitulates to the burden and even unleashes his fury in the form of stone-cold, calculated vengeance against his brother Fulgrim on the walls of the Saturnine Gate. Given what an accomplished duelist Fulgrim is thought to be, I truly found this moment epic. Fulgrim taunting Rogel as the entire Third Legion breached the Saturnine walls while Rogel hardly saw fit to even speak to his brother, replying to every one of Fulgrim's taunts with a thrust of his chainsword or massive backhand, beating his petulant brother bloody. This to me was truly one of the greatest feel-good, kick-ass moments of the Siege of Terror novels so far, as it really encapsulated the Praetorian down to a T. That is, however ready he is to turn from stalwart general manning a bastion in defence to straight away turning into the Emperor's own wrath made manifest, attacking with a zeal that would match his first captains. Of course, Fulgrim's actions during this duel could be discussed in more detail, but that's one for another video. Another achievement during the time of the heresy that I believe must be raised is Dawn's besting of the Alpha Legion Primarch Alpharius in the novel Praetorian of Dawn. I know there's some doubt in the community regarding the true identity of the person Dawn slew, which I guess is part and parcel wherever the Alpha Legion are concerned, however it's clearly stated in the novel that Rogel Dawn knew it was his brother. This was the second confirmed Primarch on Primarch kill during the heresy, with the first going to Fulgrim. I'm glad the Loyalists saw fit to even the score. Besides achieving a martial feat by slaying Alpharius, Rogel robbed the traitor efforts of a key asset. The Alpha Legion forces from the beginning of the Heresy up to at least the Siege 
play a vital role in securing routes and tying up as well as misdirecting loyalist monitoring stations and counter-attack efforts, with sleeper agents even appearing from stasis underneath the Imperial Palace itself. Dawn really took a major player out of the game when he made the concerted effort to slay Alpharius. If the head of the Hydra escaped, it's likely we would have seen all sorts of covert shenanigans during the storming of the palace, as if rabid world eaters and demonic assaults weren't enough to deal with. For Dawn's dedication, as well as peerless skill in defending humanity's cradle, we will award the Shield of the Emperor a 3 for achievements. We can consider that, after spending much time in the black library oven of character development, and all the time he has to outshine his brothers during the Siege of Terror novels, Rogel Dawn was due a little humbling in the lore. At the conclusion of the Siege of Terror, the Emperor's wounded form would be interred within the Golden Throne, his device for psychic focus essentially being altered to also sustain his perpetual life force. For the wounding of the Emperor and the ravaging of Terra's people, Rogel personally blamed himself, believing humanity blamed him and his legion for the atrocities which had befallen them. If only he knew, we'd scored him a three for achievements. Due to this mindset, Rogel would become ever more introspective, seeking to reason with these emotions while blaming himself for the suffering and damage caused by his treacherous brother's actions. As a means of reshaping his legion's strength and mindset through hardship, he would take up Perturabo's challenge of the Iron Cage. Right from the very start, this was obviously a terrible choice, and on surface level, it's easy to be critical of Dawn's actions here. After all, he'd accomplished what no other Primarch could in successfully defending the throne of humanity's galactic power from the largest military force in the galaxy at the time. Why would this strategic genius then throw away the lives of his legionaries in a grinding, seemingly one-sided siege that would likely neuter his chapter's strength? What information we do possess about the Iron Cage and Dawn's mindset is extrapolated from previous Space Marine codexes as well as Index Astartes articles from White Dwarf, so it would be great to hear a more up-to-date retelling of this conflict. What we know though is quite mixed. Dawn would only just be persuaded, if not downright forced, to pull his legions out of engagement by Rabute Gilliman, the Ultramarine Primarch horrified at the losses inflicted upon the Imperial Fists. The Loyalist chapter's strength mostly depleted and no end in sight to the siege itself. Contrarily though, we also learn through these articles that Rogel Dawn had rediscovered his purpose through the clarity of vengeance in war against his hated brother leading his mighty imperial fists from the front and decimating the ranks of iron warriors and laying low their structures. At the end of the day, we won't have better clarity of this conflict or the motivations and mindset of Rogel Dawn throughout it until Black Library detail the Iron Cage in a more up-to-date lore setting. Given that this campaign was Rogel Dawn's greatest misdeed and that there really isn't any action he committed through lack of consideration, that resulted in a negative effect to humanity in general, I feel quite confident in attributing a 2 to the Praetorian for negative events or misdeeds. By rising to the bait of a known galactic troll in the form of Perturabo, rather than consolidating his strength in a time of rebuilding and unification for humanity across the galaxy, sees one point being removed from his potential total. Rogel Dawn's character is typified by two main facets, which are his strong moral code, as well as his utter devotion to the Emperor's plans for humanity and the galaxy as a whole. He fiercely championed the Emperor's atheist vision for humanity in the form of the Imperial Truth, condemning his first Captain Sigismund's belief in the Emperor's divinity. He also believed in and taught his sons the practice of fair war instilling moral codes such as not executing an enemy on their knees, even in the heat of battle, allowing the opposition the honour of standing to meet their death. We are even privy to Dawn's inner thoughts throughout the Siege of Terror novels, seeing firsthand the guilt he feels by telling what could be classed as white lies to protect sensitive information, or feign shock when Malkador announces to he and his brothers of Vulcan's presence underneath the palace a fact Dawn was already aware of. 
He also could not condone the actions of Conrad Kurz and his legion of murderers, the barbarity and needless infliction of misery upon their enemies so outside the boundaries of necessary military force. Dawn and Conrad would have heated exchanges on the matter, one of these resulting in Conrad wounding Dawn and making his escape just prior to the outset of the Horus heresy. To most, Rogel's stoic character was the majority of their dealings with the Primarch. However, we experience quite a number of warm and even jovial moments between Rogel and Imperial servants he respects. He does not see the need to be the centre of attention, like his brother Fulgrim, or to be lauded by others, such as Horus. Duty itself is the reward of one such as Rogel Dawn, which is why he experiences such a pall of self-loathing for his own perceived failures upon the Emperor's internment within the Golden Throne, or the atrocities inflicted upon mankind. I truly hope we get to experience more of Rogel Dawn's development, both within the scouring novels, which will hopefully be next on Black Library's agenda after the Siege of Terror reaches its final, bloody conclusion, and even more interestingly, how his character is explored within the third Black Legion novel, as during the first Black Crusade, is when Rogel Dawn is last seen alive. It would be great to draw the comparison of a Dawn following the defeat of Horus, an almost broken man, to the determined and reinvigorated being he is said to have become after the Iron Cage, just prior to the events of the First Black Crusade. Pertaining to character, for a Primarch whose decisions are based on logic and who bears a strong moral code, we have attributed a three to Rogel Dawn. In conclusion, Rogel Dawn has emerged from our assessment with a strong total of 8. This places him very much towards the heights of Sanguinius and Rebute, though just underneath for his near-suicidal vengeance campaign against the Iron Warriors. Fulgrim From the world of Chemos, a despondent planet perpetually on the brink of starvation, due to a lack of variety of valuable natural resources, would emerge the Palatine Phoenix, a being of such perfection that his beauty would ensure Chemos inhabitants would sacrifice their own meagre resources to ensure the child's survival. Reaching maturity on a planet which lacked the time to appreciate the finer trappings of life, that is, any degree of culture not associated with the laborious tasks intended to ward off mass starvation, early life for Fulgrim was not easy. As with most of the Primarch siblings though, Fulgrim would not only rise to the challenges set before him, but would influence a complete about turn for Chemos population. Not only would he oversee great feats of engineering and unification upon his home world, by ensuring the planet's resource mining and harvesting equipment was reinstated to working order, he would then set his mind to restoring, if not creating, a culture on Chemos that could at last celebrate life rather than being utterly dedicated to toiling their own away in the bowels of some refining plant. How unfortunate it is that in the setting of 30k, wherein humanity is beginning to re-emerge following the Age of Strife, that they were unwittingly moving ever closer to a galaxy-spanning calamity that would again see progress suffer. Many trillions of humankind destined to again toil their lives away to ensure humanity's slipping grasp of power could last another day on the galactic stage. Considering Fulgrim's accomplishments, we could say with quiet certainty that his love for art and finery was influenced very heavily by the lack thereof available to him in his youth. His restoration of such culture on Chemos settling deeply within his psyche and thus exhibiting itself within his legion following his discovery by the Emperor. As far as achievements on behalf of humanity are concerned, between his discovery by the Emperor and the outset of the heresy, while not a great many detailed campaigns or legion deployments are recorded for the benefit of us, the fanbase, it can quite easily be ascertained that there were a decent amount and that they were truly great accomplishments. This is because the Emperor's children were a lot smaller than any other legion in the times closest to Fulgrim's discovery, and that they were lauded by the Emperor for their victories. In fact, even before Fulgrim's discovery, the Third Legion were personally honoured by the Emperor himself, in that they were gifted the right to bear the Palatine Aquila. The Emperor's own heraldry 
and the only imperial servants allowed to do so other than the Adeptus Custodes. Given they were the smallest legion for quite some time, one could draw the conclusion that the legion's drive for efficiency and excellence, already within their doctrines but championed by Fulgrim, was good reason for their exemplary record. It is sad, therefore, that one of the most historic feats Fulgrim would be associated with by the fanbase would be his besting in combat of his beloved brother, Ferris Manus. We've covered Ferris in part two of our worst Primark video, so if you're a Loyalist or Iron Hands fan, go check it out. There's a link in the description of this video. Now, it would be very easy for you to not be aware of the achievements of Ferris, especially those of his generalship and tactical nuance, as they aren't explored or fleshed out to a great extent in the Heresy novels. However, by decapitating the Loyalist Primarch, However, by decapitating the Loyalist Primarch's leadership and depriving them of their greatest and most experienced general, Fulgrim achieved a victory early on in the Heresy, which would benefit Horus greatly. Even though it is an achievement once turned traitor, Fulgrim did claim the first Primarch on Primarch confirmed kill in Warhammer history, that of his beloved brother, Ferris Manus. I believe that, given the plaudits heaped on the Third Legion and Fulgrim's own achievements as a duelist, we can quite confidently award Fulgrim a 2 for accomplishments. The fact there are not many records detailing the Emperor's children advancing humanity's cause throughout the galaxy, other than the typical Crusade compliances, does knock Fulgrim down a notch. It is known that the betrayal which incited Curse to finally turn his back on his brothers was that of his erstwhile mentor, Fulgrim. Conrad Kurz, suffering from painful as well as hopeless visions of possible futures, would confide in Fulgrim that he both foresaw his death at the hands of the Emperor, and that he witnessed a future in which Brother Astartes fought and killed one another. Instead of giving counsel and shouldering this burden to stand resolute and supportive of his troubled brother, Fulgrim, in a tremendous display of weak will, then confides in Rogel Dawn, perhaps the most fanatically zealous perpetrator of the Emperor's will. As most are aware, this went according to how you'd expect, and Dawn, with the subtlety of a Warhammer, confronted Kurz, resulting in a physical altercation between the two and Kurz fleeing the Imperial fleet along with his legion. There are furthermore conceited remarks and petulant actions perpetrated by Fulgrim between the closing of the Great Crusade and the beginning of the Heresy. For these, we can more readily associate the corrupting influence of the Learblade playing on Fulgrim's doubts and insecurities, further accentuating his preening and arrogant qualities. In all for misdeeds, we will rate Fulgrim a 2. He did betray the trust of his brother, which was a poor decision. However, there's not much more in the way of negative effects or byproducts of his behaviour that we can make a case for affecting humanity or those around him negatively. Whether Fulgrim's wand for his allegiance to pursue perfection in all things was an error given rise by good intent, a means to reach a greater goal, or a self-aggrandizing trap all too mortal in its open folly. The very ethos which saw Fulgrim's Legion achieve greatness throughout the Emperor's Crusade would also prove to be a catalyst for their seduction by Selenesh. One could argue that Fulgrim was simply a likely candidate for the malevolent consciousness known as Selenesh, given his personality and strife for perfection. However, we do also learn within the 40k novel Clone Lord, Fabius Bile himself witnesses his own clone of Fulgrim growing into the same narcissistic Primarch the original one did prior to the heresy. This consistency of character development between the two separate beings would suggest that the key flaws which existed within Fulgrim were always going to play out in favour of the ruinous powers. This way of being, this constant hunger for admiration, is a cry from the fair and just ruler we see on Chemos prior to his discovery by the Emperor. Perhaps life for Fulgrim was simpler on that planet and the possible heights of superiority he could achieve as a galactic conqueror hadn't yet inspired his deep wells of aspiration and desire. Either way, even prior to Fulgrim's fall to Selenesh, he was a prideful being, 
a personality trait at odds with our character virtues outlined in the opening of this video. However, to be fair, and ensure we're staying on track in consideration of our primary forms of measurements, the virtues of wisdom, temperance, justice, and fortitude are all present within the Phoenician's character. They are just overshadowed somewhat by his more egotistic and sardonic traits. In contrary to all these negative points, I would add that Fulgrim was capable of exhibiting incredible levels of love and devotion both towards his father, his brothers, his legion, and to a lesser extent, the humans his fleets would bring into the fold of the Imperium, as well as the ones which constituted the staff of his exploration fleet. Overall, Aristotle would not be particularly proud of Fulgrim's character, though he still had redeemable qualities, ones which saw him stand as a beloved brother, with the majority of Primarchs forging a bond with him. For the criteria of character, we will rate Fulgrim a 2. He did display all of Aristotle's virtues, though his ego often offset their predominance. This brings Fulgrim's total rating to a 6 on our grand scale. Okay, let me know your thoughts so far. That was the Praetorian and the Phoenician, two iconic Primarchs which over the years have accrued a massive fan base within the community. Write in the comments whether you agree, and if you don't, let me know what you would have scored them under a specific criteria and why. I read each comment on every one of my videos and reply to all, so give it a crack and let me know your thoughts. Jagatai Khan Jagatai Khan and his white scars characterise the savagery of the walls of Fenris blended with the stoic, refined nature of Dawn's own legion. They would inherit their Primarch's aloof demeanour viewed by any but their own as barbaric rogues. Indeed, when first united with his own legion, the young Primarch would have to again unite a people of various backgrounds and ethos, the only similarity between them being the Khan's own gene seed. You see the White Scars, or Star Hunters, as they were known prior to the rediscovery of their Primarch, were not a united legion per se, but in fact many small vanguard forces spread throughout the Milky Way galaxy, used by the Emperor to both scout ahead of the main crusade's advance, and sow discord among humanity's enemies. The Star Hunter's methods of war well suited that of the Khan, specialising in mobile attacks, executed with pinpoint accuracy, to exploit an enemy's weaknesses before falling back to rally, leaving only death and disruption in their wake. These separate forces were extremely insular, and did not look upon each other with the fondness or familiarity of brothers. It was up to the Khan to establish a unifying culture within his legion, to ensure these autonomous clans of sorts could realise the similarities they shared with one another, rather than the disparities. It was not the first challenge of this nature Jagatai had faced. Back on his own world of Chagoras, he was a legendary warlord, uniting the planet's various kingdoms under his own banner using a conqueror's tactics with the unifying purpose so common in young Primarchs. By the end of a long and bloody campaign, which the Khan of Khans used to forge purpose and unity among his sons, the legionaries, both Terran and Trigorus born, were supremely loyal to Jagatai above even the Emperor himself. This fact would cause much consternation in the years to come, when brother fought brother, and loyalty to the throne world would be prized above all else. Whilst the Khan and his legion took part in some truly magnificent compliances throughout the Great Crusade, I do not feel these could be used as shining examples of achievements, given that all legions conquered systems in one way or another. Instead, we'll refer to some of Jagatai's actions during the defence of the Imperial Palace on Terra. In a defensive siege environment completely unsuited to the Warhawks' favoured mobile tactics, he would become restless, disregarding the advice of his brother Rogel Dorn, and lead forays in person, from the front, to ensure the forces of his treacherous brothers paid for every step in blood, especially those of the Death Guard. It was an important development within the White Scars Legion story arc that they be forced to work so closely to General Imperial's servants during the siege. Typically, the Imperium servants had quite a demeaning view of the White Scars, 
with the predominant opinion of them being one of barbarism and wanton savagery. Through the efforts of White Scar's librarians, captains, and Jagatai himself, the general opinion of the White Scars would begin to shift to one that more began to understand the considering and aloof aspects of the White Scars Legion. During the siege of the Imperial Palace, Jagatai Khan would distinguish himself and his legion in a few different engagements against the traitor forces. Not only would he lead loyalist forces to reclaim the Lion's Gate spaceport from a combined traitor force of Iron Warriors, Sons of Horus and World Eaters, a massive blow to the efforts of Perta Rabo to fast track reinforcements to the palace conflict, but he would also lead loyalist components against the Death Guard's efforts to breach the Colossi Gate. Jagatai would lead a forry of his White Scars mounted on jet bikes to assail a massive traitor Death Guard force shielded by a siege curtain. Whilst he would lose a great number of his sons, the legionaries performed admirably, lance and blade in hand riding down the corrupt enemies whilst mortal onlookers manning the wall defences were awestruck at their brave charge headlong into the foe. After successfully stalling Mortarian's Death Guard in their implacable advance towards Colossi's defenders, Jagatai would lead yet another counter-attack consisting of not only legionaries and custodies, but storied heroes such as Captain General Constantine Baldor and First Captain Ralderon of the Blood Angels. Whilst this brave contingent performed admirably, slaying many enemy, further sapping the Death Guard of their strength, a great trio of colossal Nurgle demons were summoned by Araman of the Thousand Sons, practically on top of the Loyalist force, forcing them to retreat back behind Colossi. I will also mention that, like a few of his brothers, Jagatai had the chance to duel one of his siblings on the opposing side of the heresy. We get to see Jagatai fight in open combat against Mortarion, a long overdue showdown that both were determined to end swiftly and violently. In a battle of words almost as much as skill, Mortarian seems to pull a win against the Warhawk, only for Jagatai to decapitate the Nurgle corrupted Mortarian, banishing his brother to the warp for the first time in the latter's infernal history. In all, it would be great if we were privy to more of this Legion's humanitarian efforts during the Great Crusade to help with our rating system, though that can be said for most of the Legions we've discussed. For his achievements in unifying a fractured legion spread throughout the breadth of the galaxy, as well as his heroic and proactive defense of the Imperial Palace alongside its mortal citizenry and levies, we will rate Jagatai a 2 for achievements. After reading the majority of the Heresy series, growing up reading all the Index Astartes articles each month inside White Dwarf, and listening to most of the Primark novels in audiobook format, I really struggled to consolidate any information pertaining to the Khan which could be classed as a misdeed. Really the only two which come to mind are both from the Siege of Terror series. These are the Khan's unwillingness to follow Dawn's doctrines during the defence of the Imperial Palace, and his banishing of Imperial officers Nibiran and Bronn from Bad Bastion after overhearing their voicing of anger and hopelessness of the loyalist situation within the strategium. The key reason, in my eyes at least, that we do not see a great many poor decisions or ill-considered steps by Jagatai is that he may just be the most critical and intuitive Primarch of all 18 brothers. Even at the outset of the heresy, a time where all Primarch's emotions rose and flowed like a tempest, Jagatai would not only consider which legions truly did side with the Emperor, but he actually took the time to evaluate why Horus and his handful of brothers had rebelled in the first place. Honestly, an epic characteristic of Jagatai and something I'm glad was included in his story arc. This fact alone makes him stand apart from all Loyalist Primarchs. Jagatai knew there was more to the Emperor's grand schemes and plans for humankind than what he openly stated to his sons, though he also is mindful of where he and others sit within that scheme, reckoning the Emperor a tyrant of sorts, that is until he witnesses the true madness and debauchery his brothers have committed in the name of chaos, and then firmly sides with his father. For misdeeds or negative actions affecting humanity, 
we will rate Jagatire 3. Let me know in the comments if you agree with this high rating. The depths us as a fanbase can discuss or debate the actions of a well-developed character such as Jagatai are great. Due to the Khan's distant character and unwillingness to mince words with anybody, even his own brothers, there were a great many Imperial servants who not only looked down upon Jagatai and his legion, but were also openly suspicious of them. In a time where brother turned against brother, a previously undreamt of betrayal, the legion who were the most aloof and perceived as barbaric were the natural targets for ire of others. Time and again through the heresy novels we see most if not all Primarchs commit tantrums and rages that are of course superhuman in their dread, but are honestly very petulant for the most part. Regarding the Khan, he is much akin to Horus, who was one of two Primarchs Jagatai got on with the most in that they were both reserved and considered their words wisely, not behaving brashly or demeaning towards others, affording everybody respect, whether they be transhuman or purely mortal. Jagatai scores well against Aristotle's core virtues of wisdom, temperance, justice and fortitude. He shows wisdom as well as temperance at the outset of the heresy not making brash decisions which could have dire consequences for the galaxy were he to choose the wrong side. He has a strong sense of justice even as early as his young adult life in the unification of Chagoras, which is also displayed in his campaign against the Pale King, and his loyalty is not given freely, though once dedicated is unswerving in its devotion. Jagatai fights for the betterment of humankind, and for the furthering of his father's vision for the human race. In summary, we will award Jagatai a 3 for character. This brings his grand total to a score of 8 from a possible 9. Conrad Kurz Whew, well, we're going to have to tread carefully here. Let's try and do this Primark and his son's justice though, as the majority of Black Library literature only really deals with surface level shenanigans and doesn't much dive into the tortured psyche or their reasons to be the way they are. Well they do, but it's rather lacklustre. That is other than Dan Abnett's Night Lords trilogy, because he in fact, is the messiah. Now we know Conrad Kurz has more or less always been a tortured soul. Not only did he grow into maturity, witnessing heinous, deplorable acts of evil, committed by people upon others of their kind, but he also suffered from painful prophetic visions that would leave him physically and mentally anguished. From the outset, life for Kurz was perhaps the most deplorable of all Primarchs, save for maybe Angron, but even then, I know stating this may get some people's backs up, after all every Primarch grew to maturity facing hardship and the violence associated with that hardship. What I'm saying is that the conditions of Kerr's upbringing, that is existing as a rat within the underbelly and sewers of a city, paired with the constant loneliness and mental anguish he experienced, were in my opinion, the poorest experience of the 18. From the outset, without others of his kind, that is his brothers or father, to guide him through his visions in an attempt to come to terms or understand them, these glimpses into possible futures were a constant source of torture for the young Primarch, and they aided in his spiral to possessing a very warped and misled view of what quality of life is or should be. This, paired with the culture of the planet he lurked within, ensured Conrad would mature into the dark, tortured individual we witness when the Emperor first makes planetfall on Nostramo. What I will say is interesting regarding this is that as I mentioned earlier, all Primarchs faced hardship early on in their lives. It is a consistent theme for all of them. They faced some massive hurdle, matured quickly, and almost like a rite of passage, had to tap into their own abilities or Emperor-given aptitude to enforce a state of peace and prosperity upon the planet they classed as their homeworld. That is, except for Angron, and likely Alpharius or Omegon. It is interesting, therefore, that Conrad Kurz either was not able to achieve this natural peace without violent enforcement, or perhaps he was crafted this way and actually grew into the Primarch the Emperor intended. 
food for thought anyway. What some people do not know regarding Kerr's Legion is the original Terran recruits who formed the Night Lords prior to Conrad's discovery on Rostramo had a lot more in common than you may first assume with their future compatriots from that blighted world. After the completion of the Unification Wars on Terra, a young Imperium would exile all manner of criminals to the lawless depths of the prison caverns which lay beneath the vast hive cities of a unified Terra above. With no need for guards or a governing structure, this hellish place where both men and women dwelt would lead to successive generations of hardy, pale-skinned children as comfortable in the dead dark of these depths as they were dispatching others with a blade. From these hardy yet wiry youths would a fledgling Night Lord's Legion be born. Thus the children of criminals would be crafted into superhuman soldiers that would broker no dissent or crime against the Imperium of Man. Often dispatched to punish the sins of rebels and oath breakers before the discovery of their Primarch, these brutal enforcers of Imperial law would be united with a master whose fierce sense of justice crossed into the realm of insanity. Though possessing a high standard of justice, the Night Haunter, as he would become to be known, would turn from righteous vigilante to dark overlord in a fairly short period of time. Once a dark figure of justice in Nostramo's permanent night, liberating the world's citizens of organised and opportunistic crime, he would become a symbol of fear, just as likely to punish the victims of crime for not successfully defending against their attackers as he would the perpetrators of such horrors. Conrad Kurz would attempt to reach the heights of justice and righteousness expected of him as a son of the Emperor, though the continuous degradation of his mental well-being would have profound effects on his outlook on life and further warp his already distorted sense of justice. Besides their staunch expectations of loyalty expected from the planets they did visit with during the Great Crusade, there is little that could be said the Night Lord's Legion achieved to further the cause of humanity. During the reunification of the far-flung and lost planets of man, through use of terror tactics, ambush and torture did this legion of ruthless killers portray the Imperium of Man in perhaps one of its most rawest of forms. That is, of a regime which expected loyalty and tithe in exchange for recognition as a fellow human being with the right to exist. If they were smart, planets on the edge of known space would pay homage to the mother world whether they believed in the Imperial truth or not the alternative being crucifixion, skinning, or any other unimaginable horror for themselves and their children. So it is Conrad Kurz will be assigned a one regarding achievements, as besides leading his armies and compliance tasks throughout the Milky Way galaxy, neither Conrad or the Night Lords would achieve anything of great note. What also must be taken into account is the grotesque and inhuman way the Night Lords would go about their compliance actions, further hindering their score. These methods were justified by Kurz as sacrificing the few to save the many, but this morally ambiguous take on the removal of basic human rights and infliction of so much suffering on civilians are hardly so flippantly or easily explained. So we've touched on the fact that Kurz's legion's preferred doctrines were to single out a ruling class or elite upon a non-compliant planet and exact such depravities upon them that an entire planet would bow in submission. Whilst Conrad's explanation of this type of approach, that is, the few dying for the many, would preserve much more human life than an all-out planetary or system war, it undoes itself in the basest of ways. An extreme approach such as this could be used in any type of conflict. A planet refusing to comply which does not hold vital resources could just be exterminatus. A non-compliant liege or governor could be tortured and beheaded and masqueraded through the capital city. Just because these things could be done does not mean they should, or that they are the ideal choice. When the Emperor dispatched his crusade fleets, it was to unite humanity with one shared vision, that is the imperial truth a secular belief that denounced religion of any kind and purported that humanity had the right to be the dominant species within the galaxy. To unite a people so divided 
such as the human species following the age of strife, a singular vision and coherent philosophy that the masses can get behind is the most valuable and indeed important part of that plan. Conrad Kurz and his Night Lord's tactics of scaring the masses into compliance wholly undermines that ethos. A planet's worth of people, never mind several systems worth, will of course capitulate and claim loyalty. However, once enough time has passed, if that culture is not truly invested in that way of life, then they will do one of two things. They will go along with it, but be nowhere as efficient as they could be, or they will openly rebel. I believe we see this most clearly in the history of doomed Nostramo itself. As the Night Haunter, it is said Conrad brought a peace and prosperity to this utterly corrupted planet. Though due to his methods, that is, exacting fear instead of unifying through a common goal, throughout the populace was a constant dread that the slightest misdeed could result in the capital punishment. And of course, we all know what happened to poor Nostramo, returning to its old ways once Conrad had been away for an extended period, earning the entire planet death from orbit. As far as canon events go regarding misdeeds committed by Kurz, besides the destruction of Nostramo, innocents and all, one of the greatest was the slaughter of an entire city of innocents during the Karatan campaign, as witnessed by Vulcan and his salamanders. You see, on the planet of Karatan, in an effort to liberate humans who were seemingly under the thrall of Eldar Psykers, though albeit living in peace alongside them, Kurz would elect to utilise his tried and true terror tactics upon an entire city, much to the horror of Vulcan. Over the course of one bloody and violent night, Kurz and his legion would butcher and torture the inhabitants of an entire city. They would broadcast sounds of terror and dying across the entire planet, so as to ensure all knew what awaited for them were they to try and mount a defence against the expeditionary fleet. Kurz's tactic worked, and the planet's inhabitants chose to surrender rather than meet the same fate. However, Vulcan was disgusted by his brother's disregard for life, and his openly heavy-handed way of ensuring compliance. We could delve into Kurz's torture of Vulcan following the Isfane 5 drop site massacre, however these acts were committed by a Kurz who had pledged himself to the War Master, and so we will exempt him from these actions during this rating. Needless to say, the Night Lord's terror tactics, having garnered them a terrifying reputation, would prove effective at compliance actions throughout the Crusade. The downside to this, that worlds and indeed entire systems would surrender out of terror more than in an open obedience for Terra and the Imperium. This would compact issues and events for the Loyalist Legions in a post-heresy era, where worlds that were conquered by the Traitor Legions were wont to throw off their shackles of loyalty, proclaiming either fealty to Horus, or reverting to their former territorial claims before their introduction to a wider humanity throughout the galaxy. Considering the disruption his legion would cause loyalist forces before the Horus heresy begun in earnest, and the suffering his legion would enact upon the general populace of newly discovered planets in the name of the Imperial Truth, we will attribute Conrad a score of one. With as dark and fearful track record as this, it is difficult to match the Primark curse to any meaningful virtuous attributes. Ironically, Conrad's want to enforce justice upon wrongdoers and perpetrators of evil would see this ideology become twisted and distorted throughout his own psychosis, slowly devolving Kurz into little more than a superhuman serial murderer. While maintaining a general indifference towards his Primark brothers and a ruthless sardonic outlook on humanity in general, though his is a tragic tale, it is no less devoid of good deeds or righteousness. This truly is a shame, because even though Conrad would experience such a turbulent and violent upbringing on Nostramo, his core belief of justice stayed with him, no matter how twisted it would become. If only his father, or even Malkador, could have eased his internal suffering and helped Conrad on the straight and narrow, I do believe there is every possibility he could have been salvaged and forged into a mighty weapon of righteousness. For this reason again, we will attribute a score of 1 to Conrad. This brings the Night Haunter's total score to a lowly 3 of 9. This score matches that of his brother Angron, Primarch of the World Eaters, 
and are the two lowest scores on our table so far from 17 Primarchs. Next, we will discuss the indomitable Vulcan. Before we discuss the most lovable Primarch, please remember, if you've learnt something new within these Primarch videos, or they've been entertaining, please consider subscribing and interacting with the channel, such as liking, leaving a comment, or even sharing the video. As a young channel, it all goes a long way in helping us to become more established in what is a very competitive niche. Vulcan. So, we've saved the most wholesome Primarch for last. The Primarch Vulcan, for those not aware, inherited the Emperor's most divine gift, that is the power of immortality. In the 40k setting, this is termed as being a perpetual. Other perpetuals we learn of in the setting include Erda and Alanius Pius. One could make a case for John Grammaticus, though he was not a true perpetual in the way the others were. The Primarch Vulcan would experience death numerous times throughout the heresy novels, several times at the hands of his insane brother Conrad Kurz, and once during an atmospheric re-entry over Macrag. The presence of this gift is the primary reason that, even though Vulcan does not currently exist within the 40k setting, the fanbase believes there is a strong case for reintroducing him back into the lore. We've seen this re-emergence occur with Vulcan before, during the War of the Beast. On a side note, I highly recommend this series, even if you're not really into orcs as a faction. The epic moments and unique lore ensure you won't regret investing time or an audible credit in listening to it. Between the time of the Scouring and the War of the Beast, some 1500 years, Vulcan would disappear, departing from his sons on some quest or pilgrimage that he would not explain. Following this period of time, we do get to experience his brief re-emergence into the setting in the War of the Beast, when he is located mounting a defence of the Imperial-held world of Caldera, a planet he conquered during the Great Crusade alongside his brothers Ferris and Mortarion. During his reunification with Imperial forces during the war, he plays a major role in working with the Imperial Fist Chapter Master Corland to combat the Orc menace threatening the galaxy and even takes the fight to Ulanor at the head of a massive Imperial Retribution fleet. Sadly, this is where we truly last see Vulcan as he sacrifices himself in an effort to finally rid the galaxy of the menace that is the beast by detonating a power generator while the Prime Orc and himself are inside. Though this seems to almost atomize both combatants, the beast survives, so we can safely assume Vulcan does, though he has not appeared in any lore since. When we consider Vulcan's achievements for the good of humanity, the compliance actions that we normally cannot apply as achievements when referring to other Primarchs, I believe we must consider from another perspective pertaining to Vulcan and his salamanders. For them, the spirit of the Imperial Crusade and reunification of humanity's lost realm was not just a rebuilding of this lost empire, but was more so centred around ceasing the suffering of humanity's lost colonies from the many predations of Xenos influence or raiders, as well as ensuring a safe and glorious future for each member of the species. No other Legion or modern day Space Marine chapter can claim to feel the fondness for humanity the Salamanders do or the fierce need to protect not only the species, but individuals. Emotions of endearment transhumans are normally devoid of. On the contrary, we do see a darker and more vengeful side of Vulcan during the Crusade era. Vulcan commits at least two of what could be termed atrocities in our era, including the execution of an already captive adolescent Eldar witch at the conclusion of the Karatan campaign, as well as the purging of an entire world of primitive humans for the crime of siding with Eldar against the Imperium, though there are mitigating circumstances as to why they do this. Vulcan would also found the Promethean Creed as a means of instilling a sense of purpose as well as honour code within his legion. This faith of sorts was concerned primarily with the protection of the human species and the strengthening of their position as the dominant species within the galaxy teachings very similar to the Imperial Truth, but which were more geared towards protecting humankind, as well as containing a certain degree of spirituality inherited from Vulcan's homeworld of Nocturne. One last achievement I'd like to touch on 
hasn't exactly occurred in the Siege of Terror novels yet. We've seen that Vulcan stand sentinel guard over the webway gate within the Imperial dungeons underneath the palace, ready to defend his father, and indeed the cradle of humanity, from the worst chaos can throw at him, which we know from experience is a lot. Within the novel Old Earth, we see Vulcan reflecting on the fact that the Emperor knew the gate he was guarding would fail, and that he needed to succeed in holding it. In the Beast Arises series, we've seen that Vulcan is capable of holding off an entire orc army when he's single-handedly slaughtering the beast hordes on the world of Caldera. Demons are another thing altogether though, and when the prize of the Emperor's head is at stake, you know the Dark Pantheon are going to be on their A-game. I'm really looking forward to seeing how this one plays out in the closing days of the Siege of Terror. Overall, it may be said, Vulcan certainly had a big heart when it came to his view of not only humanity, but humans. This peculiarity, compared to his brothers though, was at times curbed by his genocidal actions when his ire was raised. A lot of the actions and his efforts during his more detailed life and exploits throughout the Heresy novels came from a place of wanting to better humans' lot in the galaxy, which at the end of the day is what the rating scale is about. However, when we really drill down into his personal achievements, there doesn't seem to be many. Personally, I don't want to do this, but I'm going to have to rate Vulcan a 1 for achievements. If within the Siege of Terror novel, Vulcan's vigil over the webway gate results in him beating down waves of malevolent demons intent on killing the Emperor and butchering the citizenry of Terra, then I could confidently remark this a 3. But it just hasn't happened yet, and I don't want to eat my words wherein he earns it, only for these events to never take place. At the end of the day, the point of unbiased rating is to assess the facts rather than what I or you may personally want or think because of our likes in the hobby. Hopefully you didn't all just click off the video. If you're still with me here, give the video a like and share. If you're feeling generous, maybe even sub to the channel. We've touched on some misdeeds already, that is the cold-blooded murder of an adolescent Eldar Psyker, as well as the genocide of the tribal peoples of Caldera. Don't get me wrong, Vulcan did regret both of these events, but he still perpetrated them. It seems the fires of Nocturne burn bright within Vulcan when he is provoked, and he lashes out in a very destructive way. To put these deeds into perspective though, all 18 Primarchs committed what we would consider horrific war crimes in the name of their father's legacy. So in the grand scheme of Warhammer, even though it sounds awful saying this, those two atrocities weren't that bad. He never stooped to the depravity of Kurz, the bloodlust of Angron, he never acted brashly like Lehman would, or thinks he knows best like we've seen the Lion Ponder during his video. With this in mind, because he did act out so willfully, and with purpose in the two circumstances we mentioned, we'll knock a point off the total he could accrue, which brings Vulcan to a 2 for misdeeds. By far the most humane, if not human, among his brothers, Vulcan had a deep care for the safeguarding of humanity. He felt the protection of human life was paramount and surpassed the need to, or achievement, of military victory. So caring of his brother's personal well-being, or perhaps not wanting to damage their delicate egos, he's even noted as stating to Kurz that he would hold back when duelling his brother Primarchs in fear of harming them. We also learn that Vulcan was trusted deeply by the Emperor, some may say even more than the Lion when it came to responsibly handling weapons of devastating potential. The Emperor aids Vulcan in constructing a device called the Talisman of Seven Hammers, which once installed within the Golden Throne, activates a self-destruct protocol to eradicate all life on Terra. Should the defence of the Imperial Palace fail, and Horus succeed in his ambitions, at the outset of the heresy, we also witness Vulcan ordering his newly appointed Forge Master to Kel to destroy his personally crafted weapons so they did not fall into the hands of the traitor regime. Granted, we see the lion safeguarding his, but he also had a moment of weakness wherein he bartered with the Lord of Iron for political support, gifting the secretly traitor Primarch with two great siege engines. Considering all this, the trust in him by not only his brothers but the Emperor of Mankind, 
as well as his own personal motivation and actions to protect not only humanity, but individuals of the species, we will award Vulcan a three for character. This brings Vulcan to a total of six. Honestly, I thought Vulcan would do a lot better within this rating system. However, he just doesn't have the runs on the board like some Primarchs do when it comes to his exploits during the Great Crusade, which is a shame. I really do hope Black Library does injustice and writes a bloody epic showdown between Vulcan and the hordes of powerful demons so we can revisit this in the future. To summarize all 18 Primarchs, this is our ranking, using as unbiased approach as possible. So the purpose of this four part series was to ascertain who was the worst Primarch. So we'll begin reviewing our scores with the highest totals and work through them in descending order. Firstly, Rebute and Sanguinius both have achieved the highest possible ranking at a nine each. Not much of a surprise there, considering the epic deeds of these two Primarchs. Jagatai and Rogel Dawn almost achieved the same level of greatness as their brothers, Rebute and Sanguinius, but just fell short, both pulling through with a very respectable eight. The Lion, Corvus Corax, and Horus Lupercal were scored sevens. Vulcan, Fulgrim, Perturabo, Ferris Manus, Alpharius and Omegon, and Lorgar have managed to pull a six. These Primarchs, other than Vulcan, mainly accruing healthy achievements during the Great Crusade and Heresy eras. Next, Mortarian and Magnus and Lehman all have reached a five. Finally, Conrad Kurz and Angron, both emerging with totals of three. That's a score of one across each of our criteria. This four part series has been a massive challenge, but very fun to create. So thank you for watching and for commenting as it really validates all the effort that goes into these videos. Now that these massive Primark videos are published, I'll be able to work on shorter long form content and stick to a more regular upload schedule amid my full time job and time with the wife and kids. As always, if you learnt something or were entertained and want to be alerted to more of our content, make sure you hit the like button, notification button and subscribe to the channel. This way, YouTube's algorithm will alert you by suggesting our videos once they're published. The video on this end screen, visible if you're on a mobile device, is what YouTube thinks you'll like to watch next. Thanks so much for the support guys. As always, take it easy. Have a good one.